فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافاتي وتنهل من روب الخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to bless every one of us, to grant us goodness in this world as well as in the next. Amen. My beloved brothers, listeners, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a mercy, not just to mankind, but to entire creation. And this is clarified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an wherein he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, we have not sent you except as a mercy for Al-Alameen. Al-Alameen has a very deep meaning. It is inclusive of all the different human beings that will come uh, right up to the end as well as the other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But primarily, there is no dispute that mankind and jinnkind are included in this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets. I want you to pause for a moment and think about that rank. Someone is your favorite, your closest, your most beloved. Would you allow them to see any harm or to be harmed? Would you allow them to go through hardship and difficulty? Many of us cannot bear the sight of our own children being sick and ill. Many of us would not be able to bear the news of someone going through hardship. And if they are going through difficulty and hardship, we would leave no stone unturned in trying to get them help, in trying to ensure that they are dealt with, the doctors are there, the others are there. If they're going through financial crisis, we will try and help, we will try and sweat to make sure that the beloved of ours is actually taken care of. Now, bearing this in mind, what we consider a difficulty and a hardship is very different from what the real loved ones of Allah considered a difficulty and a hardship. If I were to tell you that the greatest hardship is not the infliction of physical pain on a person, but rather when a person has no iman, when they've gone away from Allah, when they've gone astray, when they've lost the path, that is now hardship that should be bringing about pain in the heart of the beloved to say, you know what, the one I love is actually astray. The one I love is actually not rightly guided. If we see a person we love going away from the path of Allah, not giving importance to say, for example, salah or the correct dress code or something, it should hurt us to the degree that we do something positive about it. When I say positive, today we are dealing with different types of pressure from the communities and societies that we may be living in, whereby our children may be, and not just children, even the adults, affected by an environment to the degree that they tend to forget what is the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has instructed us to fulfill salah. Allah has instructed us to dress in a certain way, to be upright, to stay away from haram dealings, protect ourselves from deception, and so many other instructions we have. But because of the environment, we falter. We are human at the end of the day. We require reminders. But more important than reminding another is how we react to a reminder when it's delivered to us. This is absolutely important because many of us, we take it for granted. We are quick to remind others when they're going wrong. But when we are told even a little bit, we are offended. We feel bad. We feel hurt. We don't want to talk to the person again. Ideally, we should be mu'mineen who accept correction with open arms. Happiness, I really appreciate the fact that you're concerned about me. So that is true hardship. When we see someone go astray, we try to guide them, but they don't want the guidance. However, when it comes to physical pain, yes, it is a difficulty, but it is not as difficult as the loss from the correct path. Because this one ultimately when it comes to physical pain, or physical hardship, or sickness, ultimately, we're all going to die. There's going to be a day when we're going, to back to, going back to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we die, we will actually be given everlasting bliss by the will of Allah, Jannatul Firdaus, receive that which is everlasting in terms of goodness by the, hope, by the will of Allah, the hope that we have in the mercy 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person were to die in the condition that they are going to get something else and perhaps be doomed forever, then that is the greatest loss. Now, whether we are healthy or not, we are still going to reach the end of this lifespan. As we are sitting here, each breath we take, we are subtracting from the total number of breaths that Allah has predestined for us. So, as we live this life, let us understand the temporary moments that we might be down with a flu, down with a cough, going through a financial problem, social problem, another type of a problem, etc. All these are matters that are uh, minor in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A day for you, a day against you, a day you are healthy, a day you are weak, a day you lose a loved one, a day there will be the birth of another who is also a loved one. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why I have started this way is because with the Prophet وسلم, being the most beloved, think for a moment Allah took his father away prior to his birth. <laughs> One would look at it as a big loss. How can you say, beloved, you were in control and in charge and you ensured that his father was not there when he was born? There is a reason. We may or may not understand it. That is totally irrelevant. We believe Allah did whatever is the best. If I were to ask you, who is the most beloved unto Allah? If your answer is anything besides Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you're making a huge error, big mistake. Yet Allah took his father away. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after a few years took his mother away. Subhanallah. Imagine an orphan and Allah is saying, my most beloved. I told you when I started now, if it was beloved to us, we would ensure a different type of safety, a different type of goodness for that person. Here Allah is building the most powerful ever to exist among the creatures of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is building him. When we are in our comfort zone, my brothers, my sisters, we will never achieve. You've got to get out of that comfort zone. You don't know what your potential is until you're thrown straight into the deep end. Then you now begin to realize, I can manage. Many of us think, I can't cope. I just lost a job. Astaghfirullah. What's going to happen? How am I going to earn? What's going to... You know, Allah says, wait. You get there. You have full trust that we will, we will provide. You'll get a better job and you'll be earning more than your boss. Subhanallah. That's Allah. Sometimes Allah's taken you out of a situation because He wants to give you more. So there might be a pause of one year, two years. For us, it's depression. But Allah says, do you not trust me when I can, when I have provided for the ant that even with a microscope you might not find because it is right under the rock. You think such a big person like you are not going to provide for you? A day for you, a day against you. Be patient. Take it in your stride and you will see the ones who we love the most have gone through much more than you. We polish them. We polish them such a way that they were the most shining of all the gems on earth. So Muhammad sallallahu then he grew a little bit older. His grandfather took care of him. A little while later, the grandfather passed away. It's like, subhanAllah, you know, we in our life say there's a bad omen, astaghfirullah. That's how weak we are. Yet it was the best thing to happen. And after the grandfather passed away, the uncle took care of him. And you know, moving from pillar to post, imagine, subhanAllah, imagine. Yet he was determined. It did not deter him that he was an orphan. Nothing deterred him. He continued. He, he grew to be a fine young man. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. He was known as As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. The most truthful and the most trustworthy from entire Quraysh. Those who interacted with him, they would trust him with anything. As we would say, with their lives. Subhanallah. But he was born in a certain way, meaning Allah chose for him to be an orphan, etc., etc. Today when you see an orphan child, people, what do they think? Oh, may Allah have mercy on this child, astaghfirullah. They are so disadvantaged. That's how we would think. And if a child is orphaned, the way we treat the child automatically makes the child feel like something is missing. But why don't we remind ourselves that that child has greater chance of success than us because of the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells this to us beautifully in the Quran. Alam yajidika yateeman fa'awa. Weren't you an orphan and who gave you, who gave you what you had later on? Allah provided for you so many different ways. Subhanallah. Later on, the Prophet ﷺ received prophethood. He was given prophethood at the age of 40. 
Prior to that, he was known as a Sadiqul Amin, the most truthful, the most trustworthy. When he told the people that, you know what, I have been sent to you as a messenger. <laughs> Quraysh at the time, a lot of the cronies, they said, is this what you're calling us here for, you know? How could you, how could you say this? We thought you were a truthful one. Well, if I've never lied to you about merchandise, wealth, materialistic things that you guys love, do you really think I'm going to lie to you about the hereafter? Today, if someone lies, they probably lie about earning a dollar to people who want to really, really, you know, become wealthy in the wrong way nowadays. Laziness has overtaken some people such that they want a quick buck, as we say. I'm not worried about sweating, working hard. I got to think about how can I make money without working. And because of that, what happens is we become so depressed. It's not coming. And therefore, it leads us to do things that are wrong. Corruption, deception, cheating, stealing, and so on. May Allah protect us. The Prophet ﷺ thereafter, if Allah wanted, all of the people of Quraysh would have accepted the message the moment the Prophet ﷺ told them, I'm a messenger. But Allah wanted to test us. You know, you cannot just pass an examination without sweating. We say, have you sorted for this exam? Have you studied? You worked hard. If you haven't, you're wasting your time. SubhanAllah. We work hard. We study the books. We make sure that's when the exam comes in. But if the examiner wanted, they could have passed you. I think in some places it happens with corruption. You know, they pass you anything. You don't know what happened, what didn't happen. And the worst is in some places they fail you even if you passed. Because you didn't pay them. And that's the height of corruption. It happens. <coughs> so, in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, we have a lot to learn. A lot to learn. Here is the Prophet ﷺ, the best of creation. People say, imagine if he was in our midst. How would it have felt? And I always say, thank Allah you're not in his midst. And they say, how could you say that? I say, because if we were in his midst, we don't know which side we would have been on. Because when, when someone tells us Allah said this and the Quran said this and the Hadith says this, we think for a moment and we say, mm, I'm not yet ready for this. I'm not yet ready. You speak to people, Hajj is farther than you, my brother, you're not going. He says, I'm not yet ready. It makes it sound like I need to commit still a few more sins, then I'll go. That's what it makes it sound like. So imagine if the Prophet was here himself saying that, you know what? This is haram, alcohol is haram. The Sahaba of Allah was such, they threw it out. They, they literally, you know, got the drums that were there according to some narration and they threw it away. They didn't worry about how much money it is. With us, with the Quran said, hey, you know what? Now, is there no way that I can actually save myself from a loss because, hey, there's a lot of money stuck in there, you know? They threw it away. As a result, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and these people became the wealthiest of all. The wealthiest Uthman was known as a many Uthman, you know, he was known as a rich man. And there was a stage in his life when he was when he had nothing. Because he was from the Muhajirin. They had usurped a lot of his wealth in Makkah. He walked to Medina Munawa. He actually was, you know, in our terms we use a derogatory term, and that is a refugee. But they were known as Subhanallah, the Muhajirin. Look at how beautiful the term is. Those who made hijrah to us. It's an honor that we took care of them. The Ansar only became known as Ansar because they were Muhajirin in the picture. Otherwise, they were not helpers. You're known as a helper. Who did you help? By the way, we helped a whole group of people. How many of us would love to be from among the Ansar? The question is, who have you helped? So someone might say, well, I'm a Muhajir, you know. May Allah forgive us. If that's the case, what have you done? How much have you sacrificed for Allah? Have you worked hard? So, now let's get to the highlight of what I want to say tonight. There was a stage when the Prophet ﷺ was persecuted to the degree that they surrounded him and those who accepted Islam and stopped them from getting deliveries of food or water or anything in terms of business. Nothing. Almost a boycott. It was known as a boycott. And this didn't last a month or two. With us, if someone boycotts you for one month, you're like depressed. But he was boycotted not for a year. Almost three whole years. So much so that the Sahaba radiallahu say, Wallahi, the leaves of the tree were all eaten. We used to suck the roots in order to get some food, some liquid water. 
The hides, forget about the meat of the, of, of the animals, the hides of the animals were being polished up and they were consuming the last bit of fat that might have been there. Subhanallah. But the most beloved unto Allah, that goes to show my brothers, my sisters, the happiness of Allah is not connected ever to how much you have. It's connected to the condition of your heart. Everything can have gone from you. You are still saying, Oh Allah, I love you. Oh Allah, oh Allah, you have blessed me. Look at what you've given me. And you don't concentrate on what he's taken away from you. That is now Iman. That is Iman. That's what happiness is. That's what contentment is. You don't look at what Allah took away from you. You look at what he gave you. It might make you sad. For example, you lose a loved one. For example, you suffer an illness. It may make you sad. But it should make you closer to Allah. People say, how do I know if this is a punishment or if it's a test from Allah? Simple. What's the condition of your heart? That's the answer. If you are content with the test of Allah that He chose for you, then it's not a punishment, it's a test for you. And if you are so depressed that you cannot even get up for salah and you're finding yourselves, you're being distanced from Allah, then it was indeed a punishment. It's a punishment. That's why quickly you've got to get back to Allah. Thank Allah. Oh Allah, you gave me this. The other guy is suffering much more than me. Subhanallah, that's the true mu'min. You're looking at others. And you're looking at how much more difficulty they are going through. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there came a stage when the boycott happened. After that, he lost his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib was not a Muslim, we don't say Rabi Allah. But Abu Talib. He then lost his wife, Khadija bint Khawalid, Rabi Allah, in the same year. And she was a pillar of support. All his children he got from her, one from Maria al Kibtiya, radiallahu anha. But the, all the other children were from Khadija bint Khawalid, radiallahu anha. He lost her. So he was saddened. Saddened is not questioning the decree of Allah. Oh Allah, why did you take? No, no. Allah is the one who decides we are happy with the decree of Allah. Even we are going to go. That's why. When calamity strikes, someone passes away, we suffer a loss, we say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Ultimately, we all belong to Allah, we are going to return to Him anyway, every one of us. So if this one returned, well, we are next. That's what we are saying. If that one is gone to Allah, well, I'm also going. Because inna ilayhi raji'un. All of us are going to go the same way. Back to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after that, he decided, you know what? in order to change environment because we have a difficulty from the people of Quraysh we have the boycott that just ended we have hardship from these people they're not accepting I'm presenting the message I'd like to hope that if Allah allows me to go outside of Mecca I can go outside of Mecca and maybe there will be people outside who might listen to me Subhanallah you know sometimes in your own community people may not appreciate because you grew up in their midst they may not want to listen to you they might be this is what happened in Mecca to Mukarramah people already in positions, already wealthy, etc. It's very hard for them to listen to a youngster who's telling them what to do, what not to do in their eyes. So when, if he were to go out, perhaps he might get someone to listen. And this was the beginning of the entire plan of Hijrah. Because the Prophet ﷺ first went out to Ta'if. He went to Ta'if with the idea of taking the beautiful message to Ta'if. That if the people of Mecca didn't accept, perhaps the people of Ta'if will accept. And Ta'if was known as a city, a, a huge city close to Mecca. When Allah says, the kuffar of Quraysh, وَقَالُوا لَوْلَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ You know, they would find an excuse. They said, we don't want to accept the Qur'an because why was it not revealed to a man from one of these two cities? Which were the cities, Mecca or Ta'if? Why was it not revealed to a great person? You know? Rajulun Adim min al Why is it revealed to this man? Look at how he was, etc. That was a test of Allah. So when you went to Ta'if, you and I know what happened. It's a story that we've repeated time and again. And let me just give you the crux of it. Instead of listening to the message, they started abusing him. It started with verbal abuse. It became such that it got to the point of physical abuse, astaghfirullah. Imagine the best of creation, the direct Nabi of Allah, the most loved by Allah. And here are the people, Allah is 
If Allah wanted, He could have destroyed them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offered Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also saying that if you want, we will destroy them. The angels came with that message. That if you want, we will crush them, bring them. We, these two will come together and they'll be, the mountains will come together. These people will be crushed. But you know what happened? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no. You know, I was sent as a mercy. Subhanallah. We're not going to crush these. Oh Allah, guide them. They don't know. My people don't know. But as a result, those who threw stones, their names went down. In the eyes of Allah, Allah knows. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed some injustice to occur for a certain time in order to write down the names because justice will ultimately be served in the court of Allah. Whether you get away or not in the court of the dunya is a secondary matter. But Allah's just written it down. This man, we tested him this way. He cheated, he lied, he punished, he abused verbally. And then what happened is he abused physically. So he has failed the test. We shall punish him. He got away with it in the dunya. But hang on, you're not getting away with it later. There's one way if you seek forgiveness. So thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ was saddened even further. And as he's coming back, it was known as the year of sadness. Amun Husn. Why? One after the other thing started happening. You know, Yusuf alayhi salam, the same thing happened. When, when, when disaster struck, what happened? They were living happily. Suddenly the brothers became jealous. They decided we take, we want to kill this man. Then they said, no, let's throw him in the pit. They threw him in the pit. When he was in the pit, he still had hope. Someone came and took him up. Next thing they sold him. That was something even worse. Subhanallah. You helping me or you, or you, you, you making money out of me here? They sold him. When they sold him, he thought, okay, it's going to be, everything is going to be okay. The woman started planning and plotting against him. That was even worse. And then they lied against him and they accused him falsely. They made a fool of him. They tried to make a fool of him. And after that, they even jailed him, which became the worst thing possible. Imagine six things in a row, all terrible. With us, three things happen. We go to some sheikh and we say, you know what? Someone did something on me. I'm just not getting good luck. No good luck. Hang on. Are you going to strengthen your iman? Or you're going to drop it completely. If you're going to strengthen your iman, you say, Ya Allah, you are testing me, you help me. You are in control, you are in charge. Three, four, five things went wrong, but I have yaqeen that things will go right. Yaqeen, conviction. So Rasulullah was then given the gift. What was the gift? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him what no other Nabi was given. And that is known as the Isra and Mi'raj. The Isra and the Mi'raj. We believe, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that the Prophet ﷺ was taken in body and soul from Mecca in his home all the way to Baytul Maqdis. And it was so quick, but he remembered what he saw. And he, there he led the other prophets in Salah. And then he was taken right up first heaven, second, third, fourth, five, six, seven, and beyond. And he was brought down. In fact, he was shown Jannah and Jahannam and brought down back to his own bedding while it was still warm. How? I really don't know, but I have total conviction that it happened because I'm a mu'min and it has come to us with tawatu. Tawatu means such a large number of people have passed it down the chains that it's impossible for such a number to have lied. I believe it, yaqeen, and we all do. That's why we are seated here. Now the question is, when exactly did this happen? The true answer is we don't know. So some say the 27th of Ramadan, which means it was the night of decree, the night known as Al-Qadr, and also on that night was Mi'raj, that was part of the power, part of the decree of Allah, and that was the night. Those are some narrations. Some say, no, there was a spelling error. They said Rajab by mistake, yet it was supposed to be Ramadan. So some say it's 27th of Rajab. There are other narrations that say, no, it was in Rabi and Awwal. Why is there this confusion? The confusion is there to show you and I that the lesson is more important than the date. If you have known the date, it would have become such a celebration that the lesson becomes irrelevant. The same applies to look at uh, the night of decree, the most powerful, that the date was known, but Allah took it away. For some reason, one narration says, people were arguing, fighting, Allah says, look, they haven't learned anything, we're taking the date away. 
In other words, what did they learn? It's supposed to be the most powerful night in existence, the night of decree. And here people are arguing and fighting outside. May Allah forgive us. It happens even in our own generations. Blessed night, people are fighting. Why? Shaitan. And if Shaitan is tied in Ramadan, then his comrades from the ins, from the humankind who are operating on his behalf during Ramadan, may Allah forgive us. So the date was taken away completely in order to teach us that look more important than making it one night of celebration. It is a lifetime commitment unto Allah. The same applies to Ramadan. It's not one day, it's a whole month because it's a commitment. The same applies to the season of Hajj. It's a season. It starts off immediately after Ramadan. al ma'lumat. These are the months of Hajj. And the climax is the first 10 days of Hajj. The most powerful. It's a commitment. And after that, Muharram. There's another 10 powerful days. So this goes to show every one of us that you know, as much as Allah has created nights of differing spiritual value and seasons of differing spiritual value, days and nights, what is more important than knowing what the date is, is actually to reform yourself, to become a person who's committed to that change. What's the point of every year going through the paces where we learn the Prophet ﷺ went up in Mi'raj, he saw Jannah, this is what he saw in Jannah, he saw Jahannam, this is what he saw in Jahannam, come back, etc. Following morning Fajr Salah, there's no one. What was the point? What was the point? So that is the, 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 the crux of it. We don't know the date, reality. Number two, people say you should fast on this day, you shouldn't fast on this day, or you should do this on that day, or you should give out uh, sweetmeats because it was a gift of Allah, you should do this, do that. All of that was not done by Rasulullah, nor the Sahaba, nor the Tabi'in, nor the Tabi'i Tabi'in, nor any one of the four Imams, none of them. For them, what was it? They didn't even gather to celebrate. There was no celebration as such. But rather, the lesson was there. They taught it, they learned by it. And it wasn't taught once a year. Many times, whenever the occasion came, like the hadith, when we're speaking of all people, be conscious of Allah. We don't just wait for one day in the year and say, brother, be conscious of Allah. Let's be conscious of Allah. It's a message that comes every single time you are hearing a message coming from Allah. It's part of the message. You're reminded of salah, you're reminded of truthfulness, uprightness. That's what life is all about. To correct myself, to purify myself in two ways. With my relationship with Allah and my relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same Allah. If I have lost that, I've lost the plot actually. Because it becomes like people of other faiths who've made their religion into a season. And now, in their days of happiness, it's just a celebration where they don't even know what's sinful and what's not sinful anymore. I've sat with people of other faiths explaining to me what are the commandments, what are the sins. They'll give you a whole list if they know it. But they, do they go according to it? They say, no, that's just a list you need to memorize. That's what we are starting to reduce our being to. We know what's right and wrong. But hey, that's for the old Once you get a great beard, you can start looking into the thing, you know. That's why now people are graying very early. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So this is the, the issue. There's no specific fast or specific act of worship, neither in the Quran nor in the Sunnah. But there is something you and I need to do every day, and that is a commitment unto Allah and His Rasul. It's a commitment. I need to improve myself today, tomorrow, every day. I need to do more to learn the seerah of the Prophet I need to make sure that I'm getting closer to Allah and not further away. As I'm growing older, am I becoming a better person in two ways? Like I told you, taqwallahi wa husnul khuluqi. The Prophet was asked, those people in Jannah, what are the qualities they have that make them get Jannah? He says they have taqwa Allah, they have husnul khuluq. They have their connection with Allah is in order and the way they treat the rest of the creatures of Allah is in order. That's the meaning of it. Your character and conduct on one hand and your plug-in with Allah on the other. SubhanAllah. So I need to develop both. Sometimes we are very pious, but the way we treat other human beings there's a deficiency. Brother, you are minimizing your chances of going to the place that everyone wants to go. Sorry, that's not Nando's, by the way. It's Jannah and Firdaus. And uh, subhanallah, if you are very beautiful in your character and conduct, but you've taken Allah out of the equation, you're committing an even graver error. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us lesson. 
So those are the two matters I wanted to clarify. Sometimes there are ulama who say, don't gather on a day where the 27th of Rajab is, rather gather on the 20th or maybe outside of Rajab. There are so many opinions because they would not like it to become a ceremony where, hey, today is the big night, let's go. Brother, every night is actually a big night because every night Allah is calling out to you and I, are you seeking forgiveness? Tonight is your last night. One day is going to be like that. You've got a few more minutes to go. What are you doing? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the best death with shahada on our tongues. Say Ameen. So my beloved brothers, sisters, let's understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us. He has bestowed upon us favor. These were two very important points to understand regarding Mi'raj. Similarly, there comes a point about people who just come around and say Mi'raj Mubarak, Mi'raj Mubarak, etc. etc. Mi'raj itself was definitely Mubarak. That's not a greeting in Islam. The greeting of Islam is Assalamu Alaikum. So we rather repeat Assalamu Alaikum with mentioned in the Quran, mentioned in the Hadith, mentioned as the greeting of the people of Jannah, mentioned as the greeting from Allah to the people of Jannah, and you want to replace it with something? Okay. Let's not replace it. You know, people ask me, okay, Mi'raj, we don't know the date, but Friday, we know every Friday. What about Jumu'ah? So we will tell them, don't replace the greeting of Islam, but you might want to add something after that, which may be from your culture, tradition. You want to say, good morning, sir. You don't start off by saying good morning. The man is a Muslim. You greet him, assalamu alaikum. Good morning. How are you? Etc. You first start with salam before anything else. So it may not be, it's not wrong to say Jum'ah Mubarak on condition that you have not replaced the salam with Jum'ah Mubarak. You first start with the salam, then you can add Jum'ah Mubarak, Eid Mubarak, Shadi Mubarak, whatever else. But sometimes on the day of Eid, we roll guilty sometimes on the day of Eid. We replace the salam with Eid Mubarak because it seems like that becomes the, 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 the greeting of that day, whereas the greeting of the day is still salam. If Allah says, Tahiyyatuhum yawma yalqawnahum salam, even on the day there in the Akhirah, when they meet, that greeting will be salam. It's not going to be Eid Mubarak, but that day is higher than Eid, right? The greeting is salam. So the, the point I hope is loud and clear. The greeting of a mu'min is assalamu alaikum. You want to add wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, you do so. After that, you can say your shadi mubarak and whatever else, Eid Mubarak and every other mubarak will come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us blessings. Amen. And the last point I want to raise this evening is, my beloved brothers and sisters, whenever you are facing hardship and difficulty, a lesson we learn from the entire story of Mi'raj. You persevere, your Iman must develop, your Yaqeen must be there, conviction in Allah that He will help. And Wallahi, by the help of Allah, you will have a gift from Allah in the dunya before the Akhirah. It won't be in the form of Mi'raj, because obviously that's for Rasulullah sallallahu But it will be in the form of something that will make you happy, something that will be good. When you're going through hardship, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what did we say now? How many years was the boycott? Three. After that, what happened? Another year. And how many years in a row? Hardship upon hardship. There came a day when Allah gave him something that his yaqeen was beautiful. You know, I was reading something today. Very interesting. It said, imagine when the Prophet ﷺ saw Jannah. Imagine. And he had to come back to the dunya now. How do you think it must have felt? I really don't know. But imagine you went to Jannah. People, not even Jannah, they jump the border, they don't want to come back. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> they go to another country, they don't want to come back. Imagine if they went to Jannah, what would have happened? But he had a mission. So therefore he had to come back. Sorry to mention this, but we know it's a common problem, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. <laughs> so this is the thing that when, when Allah has tested you, one problem, another problem, a third, become closer to Allah. And a day will come when Allah, He will smile all the way. Allah will open your doors. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa A point that comes to my mind, my 30 minutes are up, but I can take a few more minutes. A point that comes to my mind is, you know, when Abu Sufyan and the others went to Asham and they met the ambassador or the, the regional leader of that Byzantine empire and he asked them questions and he said, this man, is he like this? Is he like that? And this was a Caucasian person, right? And he's asking them questions. 
And they answered the questions. He said, how is this man claiming to be a prophet? What are his characteristics? What is this? What is that? Who follows him? Who doesn't? So many questions, I'm not going to say them. But at the end, you know what he said? He said, Wallahi, if what you are saying is true, he is going to be in control and in charge of the land and under my feet here. And they were like baffled. You know, we can do anything to him right now and you are saying that he's going to be ruling under your feet here, so far away. Guess what? He ruled even beyond that. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. They were, they were arguing. This is something that really makes me smile when I think of the greatness of Allah. They were fighting over the Makkah to Mukarramah and some little control of pieces of land there. And Allah says, hang on, don't worry if temporarily this might... It might, we might allow it to be somewhere. We're going to make sure that the whole picture, when you see it later on, you'll realize why Allah did everything one by one in order for us to open the doors of victory in a way that up to Qiyamah, your Ummah will be the biggest. That's what happened. Right now, today, on the globe, there are more Muslims than ever before in history. Approximately 2 billion Muslims. There have never been so many people, forget about what sect they belong to, but so many people making sajda for Allah on earth. Never. And where did it start? With the persecution of the people of Makkah. Those who were on the wrong side, they got against them verses like Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watabba. And the others who were on the right side, they were told, Abba Bakr, Anta fil Jannah. You are from Jannah. Look at the, the choice. So for us also, there is a choice. When there is truth and falsehood, when there is dark and light, it's up to us to make sure that no matter what the circumstances, we side with what is correct, what is right, what is pleasing to Allah. We don't displease Allah and we remain steadfast. A day will come when we will see this victory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness in this world and the next. May He help us, every one of us, is going through different issues, different problems, different difficulties, different hardships. And we all look at it from a different angle and perspective. May Allah strengthen all of us. May Allah make us such that those who are really suffering across the globe today, without a house, without food, without clothing, who are being bombed unnecessarily by parties who don't know why they are doing it, and these people don't know why they are being bombed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard them. May Allah help them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open their doors. Our problems are nothing compared to this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are compassionate. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabi Muhammad.